Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, professional mediator Simon Good. In today's episode of Conflict Skills, I'm going to be talking about how to deal with someone who dominates a meeting. This is something that pretty frequently happens in some workplaces and unfortunately I think a lot of organisations have almost developed a a culture of tolerating this type of behaviour, potentially for very good and, you know, I guess understandable and altruistic reasons, like we want to treat people with respect and give people a chance to have a voice and to feel heard and to have input about the factors that affect them and all of these different elements that have contributed to this are perfectly understandable and I suppose in in a way, yes, they would be a sort of uh, principles that we want to aspire to in terms of our organisational culture or the way that our team operates. But the challenge is that when we tolerate any behaviour from anyone in any situation, it is, I suppose, a recipe for dysfunction. It means that tasks will take longer than needed. And when you're in a meeting, it might mean that you're going round and round in circles or there's this Groundhog Day almost experience of the, haven't we heard this story already? You know, this is the fourth time that we've talked about how much better the old office was than the new office that we've moved to or whatever else it might be that the person just keeps ranting and ranting about. And the pattern that I've observed as a mediator is that how this plays out often is that one person's dominating the meeting, everybody else is quiet for a period of time but what's happening is that the pressure's building behind the scenes and sometimes during the meeting or afterwards it erupts like a volcano and you know if you do decide to raise it with someone you do it in a not very strategic and composed and um, (laughs) I guess effective way you end up screaming at them or accusing them of something or saying you know what the hell's the matter with you there's 10 people in the room and you dominated at least half of the time that we had available what the hell's wrong with you? Didn't you even notice the fact that Sarah didn't have a chance to speak at all? Or is it much would have been much more effective to do that diplomatically? You now we can still find a way to be assertive and to say what we need to, to ask someone to change behaviour. But what we're aiming for is to do it in a, a calm and composed way, rather than, I guess, effectively losing it. Each situation will warrant a different response, and I suppose in terms of how do we make then the decision about what we're going to do, the question really is about what's the goal? How important is the relationship with this person? Does it matter if they get upset that you pull them into line, for example? If it's a very senior person that you're relying on for a promotion next month, then potentially a better strategy than raising it with them and being assertive is to simply be accommodating and find a way to figure out what you need to about the meeting in a different format. Um, So thinking strategically about what's going on, is this person in a particularly vulnerable place or are they resilient and could handle a bit of feedback? Is it better to do it in the room in front of other people as gently or firmly as you decide to, or would it be better to do it private? I mean, you know the people that you're dealing with and the situation that you're in, so it's worth just considering what am I aiming for here? And I know I do want them to, you know, stick to the agenda items or stop repeating themselves, but what else is important, like maintaining the relationship or demonstrating to the team the fact that this is a behaviour that isn't tolerated or is tolerated here, or it's just thinking strategically about all of these different factors. In terms of the response itself, we've really got the five different conflict modes to select from compete, compromise, collaborate, accommodate, or avoid. I actually think those last two, there's not enough of emphasis given to the positive effect that these can have. You could simply decide to be accommodating and let the other person speak. There would be particular situations where I can imagine that this makes a lot of sense. Or just avoiding the conflict, like looking down at your notes and scribbling a drawing rather than getting in an argument with someone who's particularly volatile at the moment. Or you're in a multidisciplinary meeting and there's a whole bunch of other professionals in the room from different organisations and you're not sure who's who. Maybe just keeping your head down and sticking to thinking about what you need to do for the rest of the, the day. There's some situations where that would be completely fine. The thing is with those two options, if you decide to be accommodating or you just avoid the conflict at all, you know, it's someone you don't know well or you're not sure how they're going to take it or it's not really something that you're in, you're responsible for sort of steering this meeting, 
then what you need to prepare for is some negative buildup in yourself. This would be what, you know, the Jungian idea of the shadow, the buildup of, I've really been putting in a lot of effort to stay calm and be respectful and maintain eye contact and nod and have a positive, encouraging look on my face. Whilst inside I'm saying, oh, for goodness sakes, are you serious? Why do you have to be so dramatic about this? It's not such a big deal. Well, that inside stuff, the frustration, the annoyance, the um, feeling like I'm trapped and I just wish I could get out of here, he would say that then has probably in many situations a high likelihood of springing out somewhere. You might then feel really pent up and frustrated as you're driving home and you know, slam your car into gear and then all of a sudden you don't realize that you're in reverse and you drive back and hit the garage wall or something like that. And it's this build-up of the, the negative side of trying to stay contained and be respectful, particularly when the other person's not doing the same for you. It's like, a, I think it's just this negative build-up, I guess. And even if we just think about that from a different lens, simply physiologically, the nervous system is ramping up during these types of situations. If we're running a meeting and we let someone speak and we're worried about the fact that they have dominated the conversation, there'd be a whole bunch of things then we're worried about as a result. We might be worried about how other people perceive us or worried about how we're going to keep their project on track given the fact that this meeting didn't go well. And all of that worry means that our body starts to escalate our brain at any moment is getting us ready for expending energy and so it's developing a metabolic plan for action. So there's a release of adrenaline, our heart rate increases, blood pressure, that kind of thing. So literally, physically, you're sitting there more wound up, more pressurized with this extra pent-up layer of adrenaline than when you went into that meeting. And so for both of those things, the emotional stuff of the frustration and whatever, or feeling like I'm worried that I look like an idiot in front of my team, or the physical build-up, it's just important to think about what do you need to do to look after yourself. Go for a quick walk around the building, shake, do some push-ups, do a quick yoga, go and talk to your friend, have a coffee, and just take a moment to, to breathe deeply. Just think about what do you need to do just to reset, I suppose. So the other options are compete, compromise, and collaborate. Compromise would be, I suppose, saying something like, Look, you know, it is important that everybody has a chance to have their say in these kind of conversations. Uh, I'd be more than happy if you'd like to just finish what you were saying there. And then if there's anything else you'd like to add, would you mind keeping it just to two or three more minutes, though? And then potentially we can go around from here and hear from the other people in the room. Would that be OK with you? So it's like you can speak a little bit more, but then could you please just stop? Or, yep, I'm happy for you to do this, but I just want to be clear that next time around, I'm not going to allow that. This is the last chance type of thing. Uh, collaborate might be to say something like, you know, I just want to pause and just reflect on the time that we have available and the items that we still have on the agenda. What would be a helpful use of the time? Should we allocate a few minutes to each of the different topics or what would work best? You're sort of inviting them into that problem solving type of space. I mean, that could be an option and it can work sometimes, but it's not very efficient. It takes time. And maybe if you've got a working group that's going to meet many times, that could be something that you'd consider. Just naming the situation and saying, you know, I'm aware that some people haven't had a chance to speak or some people have a lot to say about particular topics and we've only got a limited amount of time. What would work best then for us to manage this? What What do you think would work? What's your take on this? On this? And just saying, you know, are we going to you know, take some items offline or we could organize a subgroup or we could just decide that this isn't important, we can do that, figure that one out or just go with someone else to make a decision about that. There are a whole bunch of different options. The challenge there, though, is that you need to spend the time and energy of sorting it all out. And then the final option is just saying, can you please stop, <laughs> compete? It's, you don't need to be aggressive or harsh, but you are effectively saying, you know, this needs to change. The other thing that you might consider is what's the underlying cause of this conflict? Data conflict, for example, is where the other person isn't uh, sort of clear on the fact that other people haven't spoken. They might not have noticed or they interpret the way that this meeting should run differently than you. They don't think it's a problem that no one, that some people haven't spoken, whereas that's something that you expected. And on the first agenda item, it said hearing from each person about the last couple of weeks. 
Um, so it's just clarifying that data. Actually, this is what I was hoping we could do in this section of the meeting. Would that be okay with you? It sounds like you're expecting this. Can you fill me in on where you're coming from there? A value conflict, I guess, could be similar to that. Some people don't think that you need to treat other people in a kind way, for example, to be respectful. Other people do think that respectful professional communication involves, you know, whatever, not interrupting, for example, not speaking over the top of people, sharing time in a meeting equally. And that's not a value that everybody holds. And so when we're dealing with this value difference, it's really just about naming the situation and then setting up clarif uh, opportunity to clarify expectations moving forward. You know, look, I know all of us have a different idea of the way that these meetings should be run. From my perspective, it's important that we hear from each person relatively equally, but I know that's not necessarily a view that everyone will have. What's your take on that? And then you know, I just wanted to touch base because the last thing I want is that you know, we're not on the same page about how we're going to operate as a team. Interest conflict is where the other person might have a particular barrier to push. It could be something like they just want to big note themselves and it's about ego. They want their team members to think that they know what they're doing or something like that. But it could be that they have an agenda, like they're trying to drive a particular decision. They've been sent by, you know, some like the management group, for example, to push a particular decision that leadership's considering. And if you're in these types of meetings and this person continues to repeat themselves, the strategy that I often suggest is to do a very long summary. Sometimes the reason why people are continuing to repeat themselves is because they might not feel like you've heard them or heard them correctly or heard them fully. So I'd say something like, look, can I just check I've heard what you've said so far because you've referred to it a number of times and I can tell how significant this is to you. From your perspective, you feel like uh, the decisions to change office was just a, a completely mismanaged from the word go. You've talked a number of times about the difficulties that your team experienced doing things at the last minute. And from where you sit, there was no reason why you couldn't have been given more notice. It sounds like not only that's been incredibly frustrating for you, but it's been incredibly stressful watching the different members of your team become more and more frazzled. And you've even talked about worrying that they're burning out. Just as a result of this, it's almost like the straw that's broken the camel's back. Have I heard that right? So we do this really long summary, really authentically validating their perspective. We don't necessarily have to imply agreements like, yeah, I would feel the same way. You could say something like, I can see where you're coming from. Or, okay, that makes sense given, you know, you've had this other experience previously or whatever else it is. But we're genuinely saying like, I get, I get where you're coming from. And then we ask for what we decide to ask. Could we hear from the other people in the room or would it be okay if we briefly go through and come up with a bit of an agenda for how we'll spend the rest of the time that we have available, that kind of thing. And then the final conflict type is structure. And I suppose there's relationship conflict too, but that often comes about as a result of the others. Structural conflict would be really important to consider because it's something that you can often leverage in meetings having an agenda, having different people in the room, having a more senior person present, inviting an organizer to spend some time with you early in the day so that your team are all very clear on the instructions and you're not the one needing to keep reminding this person of this is what we're supposed to be focusing on. You know, you're sort of relying on other people to do that to some extent. If we want to influence someone's behavior, what we're really trying to do is to either increase their motivation or increase their ability to do what we want them to do. So they're the two areas that I would consider in terms of structure. How can we increase their motivation and how can we increase their ability? Like having a printed agenda with very clear timeframes around each topic. That would be one example of using structure to increase the person's motivation to stick to it. Or a carrot that you can promise them, if we can get through it by this time, I'll buy everyone lunch. Or um, if we're not able to cover it, then we're actually going to have to stay back late. Or if we're not able to get through everything today, this is what's going to need to happen. You know, I'll need to make the decisions without asking any of you what you think. That's the last thing that I want. So could we agree at the outset of the meeting to make sure that we stay on track simply in the interests of time? If you decide to take that competing approach and be firm, I suppose the first step would be for asking for what you want. 
I again, I often couple that with an observation. It's like what ask check. What look, we spent a significant portion of the meeting talking about, you know, the challenges moving office or whatever the theme is generally that they keep repeating. The fact that this new structure won't work. The fact that you know you don't have the stuff that you need or whatever. Um, I'm just thinking that if we get stuck here and that's all that we spend our time discussing, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to come up with any options that are going to work because we're not spending time discussing the plan. For the time that we have available, could we please shift the focus more towards, you know, whatever, thinking about the future or the three-month mark or what the team needs in terms of support and training from us as the management group? It's just asking, you know, could we instead focus over here? I don't normally suggest saying, can you stop doing something? I think cross-culturally, I just don't think that that tends to get as much of a positive result as focusing on the positive side. Can we please start talking about this? So can you stop dominating the meeting? I think that would be a particularly ineffective way of raising it because it's focused on the negative and what that means then is that it often is perceived as criticism i am not dominating the meeting and then before you know it you're in a debate about you know definitions or whatever else it might be whereas simply saying could we please hear from these other people it's i think a a respectful and organic way in some sense to get to the same outcome so ask for what you want what you might um consider is asking someone to postpone it instead of stopping People tend to have a an easier time with not now as opposed to no, even in if you've decided to um, break a bad habit, for example. Like I know for me, I often spend a couple of months during the year trying not to drink alcohol. And I really like drinking beer in particular or scotch. I mean, I like it all if I'm honest, but I don't want to drink much of it simply because of the negative health effects. And when I'm spending a lot of time not drinking, one of the challenges is, you know, you've just mowed the lawn and it's really hot and you come inside for a drink and you just really feel like a beer. Just saying not now is something that's so much easier to tolerate. If I tell myself something like I'll have one after the shower or I'll leave it until 4 p.m. and then I'll decide whether I still want it, very frequently I can resist. Whereas if I just say, no, I'm not going to drink, you know, I've got, to be honest, 0% chance, I think, particularly if it's in the fridge and cold and looking very delicious and appealing. And asking someone else to stop something also often doesn't work. I remember when I was in university, I was out one night drinking, we're all quite drunk and one of my friends was going to get in a fight and I can remember him saying to him, no mate, you know, you don't be an idiot, don't be an idiot, don't be an idiot. I mean, what a, what a hopeless way of phrasing that, you know, I'm not an idiot. Of course, that's just going to make him more angry and probably even create a bit of tension between us, but don't do something. Whereas mate, this isn't the place or this isn't the time. That's so much more of an effective way of saying to someone like, just cool down, like just take a minute, mate, come on, this isn't the place. This isn't the place to do it. This isn't the time, mate. It's almost like implying you'll get a chance to do this, even if that's not necessarily something that we're seriously promising or considering. But there's this underlying subtext of I'm not asking you to stop. It's just this isn't the time, right? Can we simply agree not to do it right now? Um, The next step you might have to do is remind them, sorry, Jill, I hadn't finished what I was saying. Or, you know, thanks, James, you've done a really good job of providing an overview of some of those challenges that you've faced. Um, again, could we please hear from those other people in the room? Especially if they've agreed to it, you can remind them of that. Now, if you're taking this competing approach, one of the things that you need to prepare for is the negative buildup. But here it's not for you, it's for the other person. You're taking control away from them. You're removing their interest. They're not going to have a chance to big note themselves or feel like they're dominating or push the barrier that they've come here to push. And so they're probably going to be a little bit, well, pissed off at you, at least initially. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you've done anything wrong. Like this is honestly something that we could predict and plan and prepare for. If I'm asking someone to stop speaking, it's very likely that they'll be frustrated, at least in the short term. So they'll probably roll their eyes at me or let out a disgruntled, like, fine. And... 
for me, knowing that this is something I'm going in expecting, I then don't react. Whereas if I haven't considered it and then they give me the sarcastic eye roll, fine, whatever, or something like that, the risk is that I jump in and you know, get sucked into an extra unnecessary headache. What's your problem? You know, we've got other people in the room. We do need to hear from everyone else, you know. I mean, that's just such a non-productive avenue to go down. Let's get more into a personal argument in front of everyone. Whereas if I know they're probably going to react in some way when I tell them to pull their head in, then it means I'm not going to get sucked into the drama. And what we're doing here is just reminding ourselves that our goal isn't necessarily to keep everyone happy all of the time. I'm going to say that again. Your goal isn't necessarily to keep everybody happy all of the time. I think a lot of people, workplaces, even in relationships, that's something that we almost define along with healthy relationship or respectful or collaborative leadership or whatever these positive phrases are. It's like, well, that's all fine. But, you know, if you're going to make decisions, some of the decisions you make will upset people. Not everyone will agree with everything that you do. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you've made the wrong decision. So you can't go into these types of situations having a a benchmark that you're expecting to meet of everybody always thinking 100% positive things about me. Um, I mean, if so, then you'll tear yourself apart and wind yourself in knots trying to please everybody. And all of that unnecessary tension that you should have probably just appropriately let them carry. They've done something that's not working within the team and somebody needs to ask them to change. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person or that they've done something that's unforgivable or whatever. It's just, it's the behavior. It's separating the behavior from the person, right? So as you decide how assertive to be in the situations where you need to be more assertive, prepare for some pushback, some fallout, some negative tension, some frustration, at least in the short term. Generally speaking, it works best to refer to their behavior. Look, I'm I'm not sure that James was finished what he was saying when you started speaking. Could you please let him finish his thought? Then you can respond. It's like I'm not saying, you know, what's wrong with you? Stop interrupting. I'm just saying, actually, I don't think he was finished speaking when you started speaking. Sort of the most objective data possible reduces the chance that we're going to be in a debate about definitions and facts, right? And then if you do decide to be assertive, of course, thinking about the phrases that you'll use, some of the examples I've gone through today could be options. Uh, But generally speaking, it's also very much about the way that you communicate, not necessarily just what you communicate. So in terms of your voice, a low, steady tone tends to work best. And then in terms of body language and facial expression, etc., looking someone in the eye tends to come across as more assertive. And then in terms of what else do you do, I suggest try and act calm and composed, confident, so sitting up straight or standing up straight, not backing down, like not stepping backwards or moving away from someone, just holding your ground metaphorically, limiting movement, so reduce the amount of hand gestures that you're doing, your face should just be neutral, and the idea really is that we're not fl- we're not fast, we're not flapped, we're um, not overwhelmed, it's under control, we're composed, we're confident, we can get through this, this is a pragmatic discussion that we need to have, this is what you've done, could you please do this differently? And whatever the anxiety and the butterflies or the anger and seeing a little bit of red of what a jerk this person's being, um, that's there, that's an emotion that we're having. Effectively, it's a signal that our brain's sending us about the situation, like this is the kind of behavior that's not good within the tribe or this just doesn't resonate with me or whatever. And we as adults can decide how to manage that afterwards. We don't need necessarily to sort of project all of that into the room and escalate the situation and potentially uh, do something that's perceived as criticism. So just being very firm, talking about behavior, asking for what you want, thinking very carefully about your voice and body language. And then overall, if this is a pattern that continues, you might just need to consider, well, until now I've taken this approach. I, you know, in that last meeting last week, I decided just to be accommodating, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're locked into that. All relationships are ongoing interactions. We've all got 
you know, two sides to every relationship that we're in and the other person probably thinks about your relationship with them differently to how you think about it. So there's no right and wrong, black and white, true or not true in terms of the relationship. It's all a subjective matter of perspective. So for you, it's worth thinking about, well, what am I doing (laughs) and how come? It's probably because of a whole bunch of different thoughts and stories that you've told yourself about the relationship. And all we want to do is to take a bird's eye view and check on all of that and just make sure that the way that that we're dealing with this is in line with our goal. So next time round, when I see them for tomorrow's meeting, um, am I prepared just to be accommodating if they decide to do the same thing? Or was that enough? You know, we, we did give them a chance to have their say last time, but now it's better that we spend more time focusing on this other area. Well, then I can plan, how am I going to do that? Should I explain that at the beginning of the meeting? Should I develop the agenda? Should we have different people in the room? Should we have more time available or less time available? Should I stand up when I'm speaking so I have a bit more authority? Should I set the room up differently so this person doesn't have a chance to sort of speak from behind everybody and nobody else could really see what was going on? Just really considering strategically all of these different elements might increase or decrease the chance of getting either to that same negative outcome or hopefully a more positive outcome moving forward. Well, I hope that that's been helpful for you thinking about that topic of dealing with these meeting dominators. If you've got a question about anything I've mentioned or maybe a different perspective, have you got a a tactic that works particularly well for you or that you've seen somebody else using? I would love to hear from you. Again, you can check out my website, simongood.com or have a look on the YouTube channel. It's just completely brand new. So I can't remember. I think I've got like eight subscribers or something like that so far. I'm just starting to upload what what I'm hoping is reasonable, good quality content. Um, So I'd love to meet you there and maybe interact with you. Podcasts, the, the challenge is that they tend to be a little bit one directional. So It means that when I do receive emails from listeners um, sort of saying that they appreciate the podcast and it's been helpful for them, uh, it really does mean a lot to me. I have to say it's uh, very rewarding. And so thank you very much for the people who email me. I'm grateful. Um, Thank you so much for listening. All the best managing the meetings that you're in over the coming week and just think strategically about, well, is this a situation where I should be accommodating or what would a compromise look like? Or maybe I should be a little bit more assertive here. All the best.